good evening dear guests thank you for coming uh, honestly we're surprised that we don't have a full audience but probably the combination of uh, the weather and having I believe seven other events on the same day uh, is the reason for um, you know the light amount of, of public we have uh, regardless uh, this evening we'll um, enjoy an uh, interesting tech talk. That's the second tech talk uh, we have since we opened the company. Uh, about the challenges in developing uh, fintech mobile apps. Uh, fintech apps are like computer games. So it looks very simple until um, you have to develop one or your own and then you start uh, identifying uh, tons of challenges you didn't even think exist and what makes it even more critical is let's be honest we're playing with people's money so we have to be responsible and also uh, the tools we're giving to our clients have to um, you know do the job correctly and pretty much work all the time so uh, when we look on the challenges they're in two main categories one is related to all different variations of connectivity issues and the other one is the look and feel on the application across different platforms so the presentations we're gonna see uh, soon are focused on these two main um, challenges we usually have with mobile applications. Uh, we'll have two sessions for about 20 minutes in between. Uh, we'll have some refreshments and after that we'll have pizza and drinks. Um, let's enjoy our evening and I'm passing the microphone to my colleagues. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Uh, so, uh, my name is uh, Sergey, uh, and here is Kirill. Uh, we will be talking uh, together. We will have two, as uh, Victor mentioned, we will have two parts of the speech. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so, we will talk uh, about mobile because uh, we are representing the mobile part of uh, DevExperts company. DevExperts uh, is building software, fintech software, uh, mainly aimed at trading. So it allows uh, exchanges, brokers, and end users to uh, trade financial instruments. So we uh, we are doing the mobile part of this, and uh, I would start by uh, removing the word financial from this and uh, talk about the generic uh, mobile challenges. Any ideas? What shall I add to the list? of mobile challenges. Okay, I've put some uh, things. Uh, maybe I'm missing a couple, but the, these seem most important to me. Uh, first of all, this is fragmentation. We have, uh, luckily, only two um, main operating systems in mobile uh, nowadays. Uh, then, despite uh, the fact that uh, current mobile devices uh, may feature desktop-grade uh, processors uh, still their battery is a main limitation and which means that computing power is limited uh, and uh, in addition there is a network which might be 5g LTE very fast uh, or it might be an airport Wi-Fi or edge time to time so this is definitely one of the th things as well and then it comes to the user experience uh, in order to really compete on the market to win the users, uh, we have uh, uh, to have the app be fast, uh, responsible, and familiar and consistent in terms of the design language. So the user uh, is familiar with what he do uh, and uh, is happy uh, using the app. Uh, is do you think there is a silver bullet to actually solve uh, these issues? We uh, don't really think there is one. Uh, so uh, 
the each situation seemed to be a bit different to another and at some in some cases one tools might work in other uh, cases uh, some different approaches work well so uh, we are definitely familiar more with our specific situation so let's uh, have a short description of what we do so what is uh, special about mobile financial software uh, first of all uh, all of this fancy stuff uh, is built uh, from the live uh, data which is uh, frequently changing its market data that ticks every uh, couple milliseconds and so on and uh, you need to uh, provide an up-to-date value to the client side uh, each and every time because a delay uh, in a matter of you know couple of seconds might end up uh, uh, with losing someone's money which we don't obviously want to do because we love our users and that's not it because on top of the raw market data we do uh, some uh, sophisticated calculations uh, there all of this data uh, is being processed somehow and we have some derivative data as well you might ask wait a minute like it's mobile it shall be simple and accessible and whatever you don't need it that that much well uh it used to be this way uh don't get me wrong these apps uh were fully functional uh, still they were considered as complementary to uh, more like full-fledged solutions whether it's web or desktop which were considered as the main trading instruments but uh, nowadays it's getting a bit different uh, we are having clients for uh, whom it's uh, mobile first so main trading happens on mobile uh, other clients uh, have like comparable usage of mobile compared to uh, full-fledged solution I would say so uh, and this means that uh, we have to have uh, equal capabilities in terms of users on mobile desktop web uh, whatever uh, and this means all the professional tools that are being used on this uh, eight, ten monitor setups, which you s can see in movies about the traders, uh, need to fit somehow into the screen of uh, the mobile device. And I'll give you uh, a couple of examples uh, what it does it mean in real world. So uh, this picture represents the uh, financial graph. It's usually called chart, uh, which consists of uh, the uh, this green and red uh, things which are uh, raw market data uh, which again uh, is being updated uh, very frequently and on top of this there are other lines here and there which are some derivative values calculated again real time uh, then there are forms everybody obviously loves forms users developers whoever well, that's not true. Everybody hates forms, but we have to have them anyway. And it might look uh, sophisticated, but not not really. Okay, a bunch of fields. Uh, that's okay, uh, but it's a bit more complex than that because in this form, uh, for example, every uh, single one of the values are interdependent to each other. So uh, at any point when user uh, clicks anything here everything uh, is being recalculated and needless to say that on top of this uh, this all these uh, values are dependent on the market data so when a market moves again uh, live uh, this whole thing is being recalculated as well and then you know we have just lists of some data and Obviously, this is dependent on the market data, which is updated live, too. So, how do we actually do all of this? I will give you a short spoiler here, and then we will uh, dig deeply in a couple of fields. So, what we do is we do 100% native apps. Uh, we use uh, uh, the approach called code translation to reuse some of the code within our mobile apps 
and then we uh, have created a custom binary network protocol which uh, serves our needs in, t uh, in uh, providing the uh, data to the mobile devices. What we gonna talk about today uh, is two topics. Uh, I will cover uh, the part which is uh, reusing the code across uh, the mobile platforms and uh, then we will have uh, maybe Q&A session and a break and then uh, Kirill will tell us about how we deal with the networks. So let's not spend too much time and let's just go on. Uh, why even shall we reuse the code between uh, iOS and Android? I have a couple of ideas here. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't want to write the same code twice. Uh, if we are developing a new functionality, what we want to do is to uh, write the code that does the thing and uh, put it into the production somehow. Uh, what is more importantly is uh, we have to be sure that code works uh, the same way on iOS and Android and maybe other uh, platforms, uh, non-mobile pl platforms as well. And I will give you a great example at the end of my speech. And uh, third thing, if we see a defect, which happens in the world of so software development, uh, we have to make sure that we can fix it once and for everyone to, uh, again, make sure that it doesn't go out of sync between the platforms. Uh, so this means that uh, from this list of uh, mobile challenges uh, which I've, been st I've started with, we're trying to kill the first one, which is fragmentation, so I tried my best to kill it, uh, strike it through, and we'll see how it actually works. Uh, again, there was a spoiler about native apps, but let's see what are the solutions uh, on the market to share the code between uh, different mobile platforms. Any ideas, suggestions? Maybe you use something on your own. Okay, um, so there are a couple of uh, technologies on the market which are really popular. The first one seems to be the most popular thing. Uh, it's React Native. It's now backed by uh, the company called Facebook. Uh, I think a lot of people know who they are and they develop all their apps, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and uh, TripAdvisor on top of this technology. Uh, it y is insanely popular. A lot of apps being written in uh, React Native uh, in this world. And uh, that's a good thing because uh, you have a huge knowledge base. You can uh, try solving your problems by going to Stack Overflow and you, uh, your questions are being frequently and uh, uh, asked. Uh, so that's a good thing. And uh, the I think the greatest thing and greatest thing to, greatest reason to use this technology is that if you started with your web application and you have written a lot of logic in JavaScript and you already have this code, and then uh, you decide that at this point you need to create a mobile app, uh, you are not starting from the scratch. So you are uh, creating uh, the app right from the existing code. And again, all this code can be reused, so the percentage is really high. But uh, it's not perfect, and there are reasons why we don't use this approach. Uh, first of all, the more complex logic you are writing, the more a uh, resource uh, intensive logic you are writing, uh, the more you are considering to go native and to write fast and uh, maintainable code uh, natively. And you can do this with uh, React Native as well. There is a bridging uh, built into the technology, so you can actually run the native code. But uh, it's not really convenient. I it's pretty hard to use, I would put it this way. Uh, as well as uh, this, uh, there was a great article from a company called Airbnb uh, who uh, at some point uh, stopped using uh, React Native and went 100% native. And one of their big points was that uh, they found themselves uh, 
with the need for every developer to know how to write JavaScript, how to write Android apps, and how to write uh, iOS apps. Because whoever changes like the JavaScript need, need to ensure that this works on the mob mobile platforms as well. Then uh, you, in this case, you are having a virtual machine inside of your virtual machine, which is not a bad thing per se, but uh, in terms of troubleshooting, again, uh, it's a bit of a downside. It's hard to figure out what's happening uh, underneath. And lastly, uh, despite the user experience might be really good, it's still not native. You still feel it a little bit here and there. Uh, like any Facebook app is a bit, a bit different to the native apps on iOS and Android. So what else? I think that the second, uh, in terms of popularity uh, will be Xamarin. It's supported by another tech giant, Microsoft, uh, and it gained it its popularity uh, a couple of years back. So the community and knowledge base, again, uh, are huge, but due to uh, React Native uh, rise, it's not that trendy today. Probably there are a lot of companies and developers who use it, but it's not you know, uh, again, trendy. And the thing is, for me, uh, the most important part is uh, the UX is not really uh, there. Again, it's m it might be pretty good, uh, and uh, that's okay. But looking at the app, uh, in a matter of a couple of seconds, I can tell whether it's written in Xamarin or not. And uh, more importantly, it's not uh, like in a good way because there are imperfections with mainly working with keyboard animations or something like which is really a bit different between iOS and Android. And again, uh, just like in React Native, you are adding C Sharp, another language, the bucket. So the next thing uh, I'm going to cover, cover, which uh, we are not using, uh, will be Flutter. It's growing. Uh, it's not that big yet, uh, but it's supported by yet another tech giant. We are waiting for Amazon uh, and U Uber to write something uh, themselves, but uh, here is uh, Google's take. Uh, and uh, Google claims it to be native, which sounds good. But there are a couple of things as well. First of all, uh, it uses the uh, Dart language. Are here a lot of uh, experienced developers in Dart? I'm not. Uh, it's not. It's not a showstopper, but a thing to consider. And the real reason, it's not really native. It's built on native canvas. It's built on low-level abstractions of the operating system, but I wouldn't call this native. And we did something like this uh, years back. We had a framework which supported three mobile platforms because it was actual, actual at that time. And uh, it worked the similar way. And there were a couple of really cool features like we uh, stored all the graphics in vector on server side and generated the uh, bitmaps for the given screen uh, to the mobile client. So we've been able to uh, modify to update the graphics on the fly. Uh, and it worked just like this. We had these two uh, interfaces which we implemented for different platforms. And for example, we've been able to have the desktop implementation to be uh, able to troubleshoot uh, our code really quickly. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of similarities uh, between all these approaches and there are reasons why we stopped using uh, this uh, framework as well. So let's talk about it. What is what is the issue? What is common about uh, these uh, technologies I've been talking about? Any ideas? For me, uh, the real uh, common thing is that uh, these uh, technologies are trying to reuse the code up to the very top, to the uh, interaction layer, whether it's user interaction layer or uh, operating system interaction layer. And uh, this is good in terms of the uh, percentage of reused code, but uh, 
it doesn't work all the time because the platforms are different and the differences uh, are observable, uh, they are noticeable uh, and they are important. Like, for example, uh, Android has back button while iOS doesn't have. The gestures, animations, uh, working with keyboard and you name it, they are a bit different. And uh, there are two ways how you can approach this. You can either uh, consider this uh, like develop something that works uh, okay here and there, or you can have to respect all these specifics uh, on each of the platforms. And uh, again, so the first approach will be fine, but it will not be good. Again, the users will see uh, that it's not native, it's not that responsive, and the animations aren't familiar, or whatever. And you can make it quite good by uh, writing the code that respects different platforms. But uh, this approach uh, has its downsides as well. First of all, it's a ton of work, so I have to write the code for iOS and Android separately, and the question is, it might at, the, at some point to be easier to write native code twice. And uh, this is, uh, the code uh, is getting uh, harder to maintain. Like this snippet is, it's really simple, but it's taken from the very first uh, page of React Native documentation. And right away, uh, there is something that seemed a bit wrong for me uh, in this code, because it says if iOS do that and if uh, Android do a different thing which uh, might work in the case like this, which is pretty simple, but the more complex app, app you are writing, the more uh, cases like this you will have, and when you interchange all of them, uh, it might be really hard to troubleshoot. So uh, my take on this is uh, that non-native uh, approach of using cross-platform technologies uh, solves the fragmentation, uh, but uh, it has the downside of bringing the UX, which is not uh, perfect. Uh, the resources consumption, uh, I wouldn't have a very strong opinion. I don't think it's uh, like awful, uh, but uh, usually it consumes a bit more compared to the native app anyway. So I call it this yellow. So if you we are not going to go non-native with uh, the CRESS pl pl platforms frameworks, what do we do? What are other options? And I have a couple of them for you as well. So uh, one of them will be to write thin client, uh, which means uh, every calculation happens on the server side and uh, client side code bases are only responsible for uh, drawing uh, all this UI and showing these values. And uh, it might work to some extent, but there are issues with this too. So this is uh, the screen which, uh, as as it was previously, which respects the uh, real-time data and uh, the user input and recalculates all these uh, tons of values and these graphs on the fly by any change that happens. Uh, and let's have a look what will happen if user tries to drag this th this thing. All of this shall be recalculated. So what will happen if we go the thin client approach? User input will be handled and sent to the model, regardless of uh, what architecture you are using it, MVP, MVC, Viper, whatever. You have some kind of model on the mobile, right? And this code will... Uh, read the user input and send it to the server side. Server side will recalculate all the values, send it back, and we will uh, populate it in the UI. The only problem will be here. We don't know how much time will it take to uh, communicate to server. It might uh, take a really long time if the network is bad, like it might take seconds, minutes, hours, weeks, days, I don't know. Uh, but even if we assume that our network is really good and we are able to uh, do this back and forth in 100 milliseconds, uh, which is not bad, uh, in order to for the UI to be smooth, we need to make it 60 FPS. 
and to do this we have 16 milliseconds per frame so we either uh, slow everything down and the user notices that the speed is uh, not that good or alternatively uh, we show the progress spinner which everybody hates so we don't want to do this so uh, what we want to do is we want to have this model which calculates everything that is dependent on user input uh, on the mobile device and we receive only pre-calculated data from the server side but again we are uh, this means that we need somehow to uh, write this model and in our case we really want to reuse this code between the platforms so how do we do this uh, again two ap approaches will be shown uh, one of them which we don't use uh, have anyone heard of Kotlin native cool uh, so uh, in short it's created by JetBrains the company who uh, created uh, IntelliJ IDEA, Android Studio, AppCode and a lot of IDs out there as well as the Kotlin language itself the idea of the technology is that you can write Kotlin code and build it to the native library for different platforms using the LLVM stack it as well might be shared between not only mobile platforms but it might work uh, on the backend and it might work on the web but we will leave this aside for now what like it seems uh, really similar to the previous approaches like react native even uh, is being named similarly what's the difference the difference is it's designed to be interoperable well with the native code so uh, it's not designed to build the UI on uh, top of uh, with it you can do this but uh, that's not how it's supposed to work the work the idea is you write the UI in your native language on your platform and then you link the code which does the magic this model thing and uh, use it uh, on iOS and Android and again compared to the other technologies I've been talking about as long you are uh, you're writing your Android app with uh, Kotlin which uh, since a couple of weeks back is declared to be the default way to go uh, because Google at Google IO said that that's that, that that's how it works now uh, you're not bringing yet another language to to the mix so you have to know Kotlin and you have to know uh, Swift or Objective-C uh, in your mobile development but again as I've said we don't actually use it and there is a huge and important reason for that the technology is not that ma mature it's young it's experimental and uh, there are no uh, big players and no uh, popular apps that are uh, at this point built with Kotlin native which uh, means that there is no guarantee that IntelliJ at some point feels like it doesn't really work the way they want it and stops the support of this and if uh, I don't want to be in the situation when uh, in this case we are heavily dependent on this technology and even more to this uh, despite uh, uh, the uh, IntelliJ is famous for building tools for developers the tooling for Kotlin native is uh, not yet there it uh, work not very good f in uh, different reasons like uh, hard to debug uh, syntax highlight uh, doesn't work all the time and so on and so on so it's it's hard to use at this point but if this uh, will continue develop at uh, the way it works right now uh, I expect this to be big uh, shortly but actually let's get back to what we do finally the concept is uh, code translation it's as simple as it sounds we take uh, code in one language and we produce the code in other language just like a translator in the real world works and uh, we went this road uh, back in 2009 uh, we created the tool that's called DXbyte and uh, since uh, 2009 we've been using it in production for uh, a number of our application what it 
did actually it, it it has been able to convert relatively simple Java code into the Objective C code, and by like by simple, uh, I mean I mean really simple. So for example, in the modern world, it's hard to imagine the code without generics written in Java. So it doesn't support generics. It doesn't support a lot of uh, sophisticated collections and uh, multi-threading that you might want to use in uh, Java in your Java development. And uh, it hasn't been able to handle the routine cycles, so you had to uh, solve this task manually, actually. But still, all of our uh, projects at that time used this tool, and uh, it was a miracle for us because we've written the model code once and used it across different platforms uh, continuously. But uh, as you might notice, I've been saying all of this in past tense. Was, has been, and so on and so on. Sh shall we consider that it was a bad idea and we don't use it no more and that just doesn't work for some reason? Well, um, no, actually, because uh, we found that we are not alone on this road and uh, we found the tool that is called j 2 Objective c uh, which started around 2012. So what it is, uh, j 2 Objective c is created by uh, another tech giant we've been talking about all the time, uh, it's Google. And uh, first version, first uh, public version was Alpha and it was completely unusable, so we tried it and it produced uh, the code that didn't compile right away and as code didn't compile, we thought that uh, that's not something uh, we can actually use because it's hard to use code that doesn't compile. But uh, starting from 2016, we've been able to uh, use it uh, as, as a stable solution uh, which uh, compared to our tool is able to translate pretty much any Java into Objective-C. So it supports all the multi-threading, all the collections and so on. Uh, st standard library is uh, like almost full. There are limitations, but I don't think a lot of people will uh, be able to find them in the real world. And over five years we developed it. Yeah, because there was nothing on the market that suited our uh, needs. Uh, and uh, the last important thing is uh, actually uh, Google writes uh, their uh, iOS apps using the j Objective C. It maps, Gmail, whatever, all of this uh, use j Objective C to translate the code. So, how it works? A simple example we have uh, a piece of Java code, some method, and then we receive uh, the kind of readable uh, Objective C code. Uh, so again, the good thing here is that you can actually read this code and it's not black box. Uh, you can find out what, what it does, you can troubleshoot it, you can debug this code. So uh, it's not perfect, but it's okay. And uh, how is it actually supposed to be working? Like there is an approach that is used in Android Studio. Uh, who Who is writing Android apps here. Okay, so uh, you shall probably know that uh, there is a, a conversion uh, from Java to Kotlin built in uh, the IDE. So you sh push this for something buttons at the same time and uh, you find yourself with uh, Kotlin code instead of Java code and then you develop this code. So this is not how it works. Uh, the idea here is uh, the code you are modifying manually is the Java code. If you want to change anything uh, in your uh, shared code, you modify Java. The uh, objective code is not extremely development friendly and moreover you n need to make sure that this code is in sync with the Java. So uh, the recommended approach is even to build it to a static libra library with some uh, simple interface that you're just interacting with from the uh, other uh, parts of your applications. And that's pretty much how, how we use it. So that's, again, that's the solution we use and uh, we love using, 
but it wouldn't be fair if uh, I wouldn't talk about the drawbacks because all the previous technology deserved some talk about what's really bad about them. And uh, here are two things that are not perfect. First of all, uh, sometimes the code is a bit ugly. If you write a simple builder on Java, uh, you receive this uh, screen of uh, hardly readable code. Again, you still can uh, troubleshoot it, you can still debug it, which is a, a good thing. But you don't really want to uh, work on this code extensively. You better hide it and use it uh, like more in the bl black box manner. But that's most, most uh, the most striking uh, drawback, but it's not the most important. The other important thing is uh, the memory model of JVM and Objective-C runtime are different. JVM uses garbage collection, while Objective-C uses reference counting. Uh, and uh, the thing called retain cycles simply doesn't exist uh, in uh, Java. So just just to have a quick uh, explanation for some of you who might not be familiar with uh, retain cycles, uh, reference counting works a uh, very simple way. Uh, the object might be deleted from the memory when there are zero uh, references uh, to this object. And uh, the easy, simple construction like this with two objects referencing each other uh, will not uh, be deleted from the memory because the reference count for both objects uh, is uh, positive. And in Java, this would be garbage collected because uh, all of this, uh, both of these ob objects are not traceable from uh, GC roots. So again, when you are writing Java code, you don't have this, but when you translate the code, you do have uh, this problem. And it means, but but you have to solve it is this in Java. How how it's usually being solved is that you uh, modify one of the references and make it weak, which uh, means that it doesn't it isn't uh, being counted. And to do so, luckily, J to Objective C provide the tool set, uh, which is uh, Java annotations, uh, which you can use to. Uh, let the uh, translation tool know that uh, the references in the output code have to be uh, weak in this, ca in this case. Uh, to sum up the code translation approach as I see it, uh, it solves the fragmentation part uh, pretty good because we are able to reuse a big and important piece of our code and it doesn't ruin the UX because UX is native, it's written uh, natively for each of the platforms. Regarding resources, uh, it might be a bit slower than uh, you can write the highly optimized code in Objective-C uh, by yourself, but it's still a native code and it works relatively fast. So I wouldn't say that there is a uh, really noticeable difference here. So. Uh, we've been talking about this model and this recalculation of everything in the financial app and you might ask, uh, like, do we really need this outside of the financial industry? Does this part of the code exist that deserves this translation? And uh, I have a great example for you. Uh, probably a lot of you have been writing something like this uh, during uh, the school years or uh, university years or taking the uh, programming courses because I did a couple of times in different languages. It's a calculator. And we, at some point, we thought what can be easier. You understand uh, this thing, it's really easy to implement, uh, but we were so wrong. It's way more complex than that, actually. Uh, let's have a look. We have this uh, expression, and uh, in the modern world, we have a lot of calculators around. So we have different operating systems, different tools, and so on. So we tried out uh, using uh, this ex calculating this expression uh, on the calculators we know and use frequently. So Microsoft will give us 48.5 which is a nice number, it's positive, 
and it's I like it almost 50 um, then again we are talking a lot about tech, tech giants so let's do it the Google way this time for some reason it's negative uh, I like it a little bit less but okay so the next tech giant uh, will be Apple and its spotlight will give us an even lower number which doesn't really matter but again this is the third number we see and uh, do you expect that uh, the other calculator from the same uh, company will work the same way? Uh, I did but uh, it doesn't work this way uh, the Mac OS calculator gives uh, another uh, version of this uh, number and uh, to be fair um, I don't want any of other financial uh, our financial apps to show different balance uh, to the user on different platforms so uh, if we are writing this code multiple times uh, there is a huge risk that we calculate something a bit differently and uh, that's that's the model even this calculator has the model which we might want to share between the platforms and I would love to share it with uh, desktop and web and whatever uh, exists in the world so after this example to to sum up uh, my thoughts on this first of all I encourage you everybody uh, every one of you to think of uh, the way uh, to reuse the code due to the the calculator example you don't want to fix uh, the bugs twice and you don't want to fix uh, the bugs differently uh, the and there is I'm I'm not saying that like Jade Objective-C or Kotlin native works for everybody that's uh, totally understandable but uh, you might want to pick solution that fits for some of you react native will be gr a great fit xamarin j to objective c react native creating your own technology that uh, uh, allows you to reuse the code whatever uh, don't try to rush and uh, take the most uh, hyped or most popular solution just uh, find your uh, case uh, express the what what do you need to achieve and uh, what are your limitations and figure out what actually fits uh, your uh, exact situation because it might be different and by doing so I highly recommend you not to not ruin the UX because a great example I was trying to check the status of my flight by flying uh, to here a couple of days back and the app of the airline, I wouldn't name it, uh, embedded basically the uh, website into the app, and it was insanely hard. I wasn't, I haven't been able to uh, check my flight sta status, so I went to the uh, hardware solution that that works. And speaking of uh, the some of the interesting things we've been talking about. I suggest you to consider niche solutions as well because uh, there might be uh, not very popular and there might have their lim limitations but again uh, some of them might fit uh, your exact case pretty well so thank you everybody any questions to me feel free to ask uh, I would love to uh, discuss uh, these things uh, Anything? Yeah. Uh, do you think it's a new trend in the sense where the whole uh, ecosystem is spread out? So uh, the government is spending a lot of money in the way of sensors and cameras and glass and now the forest is also very popular. Yep. And uh, I am an artist who know a lot of drawing and writing. Uh, so so you would have much more in the way of sensors. Uh, why do you think the comparison between how our 
Yeah, thank you. So uh, I probably hasn't been able to uh, explain it, it more in more detail because that's exactly what we do. We don't translate the UI because UI, uh, in my opinion, has to be native. Uh, there is a lot of uh, good things about native UI. So UI is written natively and we have the library which we call model, which has been translated and used by uh, iOS and Android. <laughs> okay, then, thank you. Uh, then we will have a break. Uh, how? 15, 20 minutes? Uh, we have like a 15 minute break. You can grab some beer and some pizza, which should arrive very, very soon. So, yes, feel free. Yeah, and Kirill will continue in more. I think hardcore part with a lot of in-depth discussion. And uh, while uh, we are having a break, there's a uh, number of links to the technologies I've mentioned and to the article from Airbnb as well. You can just scan it and go through these links. So again, thank you so much. So we're ready, I think. Um, hello everybody again, my name is Kirill and uh, I will be covering another topic. Uh, it's working with mobile networks. And before I start, um, yeah, we're going to be a little bit more uh, technical with this part, but before I start, uh, could you tell me what's your favorite way of communicating between mobile client and the server? Maybe it's HTTP REST, maybe it's web sockets. HTTP REST. So yeah, I was expecting that and I think HTTP REST is still dominating because it's easy. Everybody knows that there are a lot of libraries out there so you can kickstart your application literally with having uh, one or two dependencies in your, I don't know, Gradle script or something like that. And uh, what basically we want and what we expect from, from working with network. In perfect world, um, it's going to look like this. You have an app, you have your server, you do a request and you get a response. It's easy, right? And everything works like this, right? Um, I don't think so. And really, what's really happening, and uh, even if, if we don't speak about uh, pure network connection or uh, uh, connectivity issues, uh, there are objective reasons to have this kind of behavior because this is a mobile device. Uh, you don't use it constantly. You switch between apps. You go into background. You read your instant messages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, when you put your app in the background, you can't uh, actually work with networks, uh, especially in iOS. But even even in Android, it's probably not good not a good idea. So what's really happening? You may do a lot of request attempts. Uh, they may fail, and then you have to redo it again manually. And they probably succeeded and then you lost response somewhere and uh, uh, everything is happening again and again and what you definitely don't want to have is uh, this one. So um, as Sergey mentioned, we're working really hard to bring the best user experience uh, to users of our apps and uh, this is something you don't really want to show um, often. 
Uh, okay, uh, let's move uh, on to our use case. Uh, again, I will repeat Sergey's uh, um, words. We l we are working in very dynamic environment. We uh, work with live market market data, and it's uh, re literally constantly uh, brings us updates uh, within that market. And what we actually want to have is a kind of subscription like interaction. We want to have one request and receive many, many responses on that. So um, literally you want to say, please give me a price for that Apple shares. And you don't want to resend it and repeat, uh, repeat yourself. You just want to keep uh, getting uh, updates. And uh, again, you don't want uh, everything to be really hard to use. Uh, you would like to have it easy to use. Um, so if we get go back to our diagram, we want something like this. We want to work around uh, the whole complexity of interaction uh, with the remote side in mobile world uh, with a simple uh, transport layer which gives us an opportunity to work in a way we want. We want to make a request and, and get a response uh, when it's available. Um, and also we can't forget about the amounts of data we're going to transfer back and forth because, because we are expecting uh, a lot of data coming at a high, uh, very high rate um, so that's why we decided to go binary. And why binary? Um, does it really matter? Isn't it an overhead here? So instead of answering this question directly, I would like to tell you a story. Um, do you know what Telegram is? Yeah? yeah? So I, I, I don't know if you're really familiar with that, but this is an instant messenger and the WhatsApp uh, is the instant messenger as well. And uh, this, is th uh, this is not related to financial software, just my personal experience. Um, whenever I'm in a bad network conditions or, uh, or I, I don't know, I'm in a roaming when the um, bandwidth is really low, um, I find myself discovering that each and every time Telegram just works. And uh, I don't experience a lot of issues until I have signal at all. And uh, with the WhatsApp it's not that, um, it's not that convenient situation because I often find it, uh, that it doesn't work, it tries to connect desperately and uh, loses the connection. Uh, each and every time. Um, so what's the difference? And the difference is that uh, Telegram is actually um, has its own binary and open source, by, th by the way, you can check it out if you didn't, um, protocol to communicate between server and uh, client. And WhatsApp uses uh, XMPP protocol, which is XML based and it's text based. So Probably that's the difference. And if we go back to our use case, we again, we're talking about financial software, about trading software. And as Victor mentioned, Sergey mentioned, if um, there is a problem with connection, which when it's crucial, people may lose their money. And if we have um, an opportunity to help them with that, if even, we, even if we, it's not that often, maybe, but all of us go into vacations, all of us, uh, I don't know, um, using, all of, all of us use planes, and if you have any connection on planes, it's, it's usually pretty crappy. So if we have an opportunity to deliver the service to our users, we want to take it because... Plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> probably. <laughs> but, but we can't deliver a plane to all our customers <laughs> like this, so... Uh, yeah, if we, w if we can take an opportunity and, and deliver the service to our users, uh, there is no compromise because they are risking their money and we don't want... Uh, our technology to be the reason why that happened. And by the way, there is a case, again, real one. One of our users said he, he used to, to use his yacht really often and the satellite network is not that good over there. So he wondered if, if it will be working there. So, yeah. Um, having this, we've come up with something like this. We developed a mobile transport uh, layer, which is cross-platform, which is uh, which has been designed to be uh, used at mobile and to be used in unstable network conditions. Uh, so uh, we don't want to put any overhead on uh, library's end user, and by end user I mean uh, developer who develops the app. Um, so everything has to be smooth and run under the hood. Um, also, we want to have data and traffic optimization within this transport layer, and let's uncover everything a little bit uh, step by step, uh, but first let's give it a name. Uh, we call it Pipestone, and mm, the reason is we had uh, a lot of maps hanging on the walls in our office, and we decided that we want to give 
uh, this library a name by picking a random map and a random city within the, that map, and it happened to be United States and the city of Pipeston somewhere in Minnesota, so uh, that's just the reason. And uh, every time I will mention Pipeston further uh, in the presentation, I mean our library and transport protocol. So uh, what Pipeston is? It's a uh, cross-platform, again, and by cross-platform I mean it's written pure Java, and we use a JTOPC translation tool uh, in order to deliver it to our iOS applications. And the most important thing here is that um, we use it, uh, we translate it with JTOPC and deliver it without any modification at all. So all the concurrency issues, all the uh, multi-threading code, everything works just out of the box. So you don't have to do anything at all. You just translate it and it works on the iOS, which is really cool. So how exactly does it work? Um, as I said, we would like to have subscriptions. Like we want to have one request and get many responses. So we have an entity we call Feed for that. Um, and uh, what is remarkable about Feed that it has effortless self-recovery. So whenever uh, the network fails or uh, you have a disconnection or you put your app into background and coming back, uh, Feed does everything for you. It, you don't have to do anything at all. You, you just have to subscribe for data you are waiting for and then Feed will do it um, for you under the hood. So the, the scheme of the interaction looks like this. So you make a request, uh, let's say, give me a price uh, of Apple shares, and then you get constant responses um, as, as soon as uh, this price is changed. Uh, so you don't need to pull anything about, uh, anything manually. Um, and sometimes you need to do a one-time interaction, like you want to change the setting, or you want to issue an order, you want to close your position or something like that, you want to do uh, to, to this, you want this to happen only once. So we have another entity here and we call it just action. Uh, and um, action is something which uh, give you zero or no response, or one, sorry, <laughs> response for, for your request. And why zero? Because there is no self-recovery. Because actions are something um, which something which which uh, can be really destructive. So, for instance, if you try to issue an order, let's say, um, I want to buy 100 Apple uh, share stocks. So, and then you lose a connection and it's recovered in 10 minutes. Probably the price is very different, and you don't really want to resend it automatically. So it's up to developer to decide, uh, or up to um, and uh, or up to uh, up to user of the app to decide if he needs uh, resend it or not. So the scheme is even simpler. Right, so this is the only thing we have on the high level, uh, right? We have feeds and actions, and that's it, because having these two primitive, you can build any interaction you would like. Um, and actually, this is enough uh, pretty much for everything. And uh, again, what is important, it's all, all the complexity is hidden under the hood, so you don't have to deal with uh, very much, uh, you don't have to deal uh, with the problems of maintaining the connection, you are rather solving your business tasks. Okay, let's, uh, in order to understand how it helps us to focus on uh, business tasks, let's uh, discover how protocol works. Um, the protocol is based on TCP, so we picked TCP because it's uh, fast enough. You, you know, we don't want to deal with uh, manually following, uh, manually managing the datagrams which can be lost, etc. in UDP, so TCP is just fine. And also it's uh, using uh, TLS SSL secure sockets in order to have everything encrypted on both sides. Um, each and every interaction within Pipeson protocol uh, happens in three steps. Uh, so first one is handshake, and step two is session establishment or management, uh, how would you like it? And the third step is the most important one, it's actual working cycle of the protocol, is business data exchange. Um, let's follow these steps. First one is handshake. Um, this is ba basically the point at which both sides try to know a little bit about each other. They exchange meta information, who is connecting, are we compatible, uh, what connection options do you want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And if both sides are happy with that, we go in straight to the next one, and it's uh, session management. Um, I will be schematically uh, showing <laughs> what is happening at this step. Actually, this is a client application, it is a server application, no one is connected to nobody, and um, everything is clear at the moment. So as soon as uh, connection starts, handshake 
uh, going well. Um, both client and server side creates uh, objects called what we call session. And these docs are session, basically, sessions. Uh, you can think about session as, uh, as about something like cache. Or, uh, so uh, the client side cache is responsible for um, having all these uh, feed subscriptions and maintaining their stability and maintaining their c uh, consistency. And the server side cache actually has the opposite entities uh, corresponding to feeds on the client side. So um, both, ses both sessions are stateful and responsible for this uh, business data exchange, which we'll, uh, we will uncover a little bit later. So what happens if uh, the connection is lost? Um, so if it's lost not more than for two minutes, which is quite common because, again, it's a mobile device. You usually go check your email, you go check your instant messages, whatever, and chances are you're coming back very soon. So we don't clean up everything really fast. We give uh, like about ten, two minutes. Um, to our client to connect back. And if it happens, uh, everybody are happy, both ducks are alive, and uh, they just, if they're happy and if they think that um, they are on the same page still, they continue from the very same point, they stopped exchanging messages and everything continues very smoothly. And um, then you just leave the app and leave it for a longer period of time, let's say for 10 minutes. and. Uh, the server kills its duck then, sadly. Um, that's because probably you're not going back very soon. But if you do, and uh, your client's side duck is still alive, um, it knows everything about what you have been requested before. So as soon as reconnection happens, um, the client session is responsible for restoring everything. It just resends uh, each and every request, and um, then it's hap all happening again. And Again, it's all happening under the hood. So in both these cases, even longer absence or shorter absence, you as a developer uh, has to do nothing, actually, um, as long as client side is still in, in memory. So uh, when the session is established, then the actual data exchange is uh, taking place. Um, here, uh, client and server send each other packets. And please uh, uh, don't... Uh, don't think the packets, is this is a TCP packets, it's just uh, higher level entities, that we just call it the same way. Um, what we call packet is just list of business level objects. Um, and uh, the most important thing here is that it has versions. Uh, each packet has version. And um, versions are used to, first of all, to both client and server side understand where they are at the point of the exchanging of, of the messages. And uh, it's also used in that previous step uh, for that ses session restoration mechanism because if the versions are the same, they think they are on the same page and they can, can safely continue exchanging messages. Um, another important thing is actually when uh, both of them send their packets. Um, in perfect world, what we want is something like this. Like we send our request to the server side and then server keeps updating us with whatever that data uh, it has. But what if we won't be tracking the state of the client? Uh, what, if, what actually happens this at this point in time, we don't really know, because probably you have very slow connection. If uh, server doesn't know uh, anything about that, um, client probably is not able to read all these packets in time and you will be getting constantly slowing and slowing, uh, I mean, not up-to-date and not up-to-date data um, until the buffer overflows and connection is closed. So we don't want to, do to have that. Instead, we um, set up our exchange message exchange between client and server in a ping-pong fashion. So each and every time uh, the one party wants to send something, it should uh, be sure that it already received something before. And uh, just because we don't want to constantly polling everything by ourselves, we, uh, client usually sends empty packets, which, called, which are called heartbeats. So as soon as server received uh, a request or uh, just a heartbeat, he knows that, okay, a client probably processed everything I sent it before, so I can start preparing another uh, um, request a response for 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 this client and even if you have very very slow connection 
the advantage of this approach is the, is the following. At this point of time, when, when server received the acknowledgement of receiving previous packet, he didn't do any job before. So as soon as he received this acknowledgement, he started collecting data. And so the data he collects is as fresh as possible. So uh, each and every time, even if this gap is like 20 seconds maybe, you will still get the most recent data anyways. Um, as, as much as possible within this connection. Okay, um, this is all interesting stuff by itself, but we didn't say a word what's within the packet, what the data we're transferring and how we do it. Um, of course, there's a couple of words about data optimizations and uh, so on and so forth, but it will be coming a little bit later. First, I would like to talk about backwards compatibility. Um, yes, in modern mobile world, uh, App application updates are not an issue because we have app stores, we have Google Plays. Should we worry about um, all the applications at all? Um, yes, we should because um, there are various reasons. For first of all, first of all, um, sometimes in mobile world it's not that uh, often that people use automatic updates because they don't want surprises with their money. Um, they usually switch it off. So we have a couple of uh, older versions still online uh, in production. And also there are um, more objective reasons like delays between deployment of your new server and the uh, actual application update of, our, of your customers, of your users. Um, even if you just submit the app to App Store, there is a delay between it, it's been submitted, then reviewed, and then available to public. Um, you don't want to force any updates on your user. You don't want to have these you know, alert boxes saying, please update your app, because again, it ruins the user experience and we don't want to do that. So backwards compatibility is a must. Um, what actually we understand by backwards compatibility is that any, in, in perfect world, any older clients must work with the, any newer servers. So this means that we want to include our features in our new versions and probably want to remove some of the existing features. Um, let's talk about adding a feature first. So we have an object here. This is a quote, and quote consists of two integers which are buy price and sell price. And for just for sake of uh, simplicity, they are integers. Um, in order to send it to the remote side, we just can do this. We uh, write four bytes, which is buy price. We write the next four bytes, which is sell price, um, and then um, we read it on the remote side in that, in, in that very order. And that's it, easy. Let's add a feature here. We introduced uh, last trade price, which is the price of the <laughs> last trade. Um, so, and imagine the situation that uh, one of, uh, of the parties connected to each other still has the previous version of the app. And it tries to send us a quote. And uh, we probably will read it something in this way. We will uh, write our buy price in last trade price and our sell price in buy price, and we'll be waiting for for actual sell price forever um, if we're just not aware of whom we're interacting with. So, in order to solve this, we can just do a very simple thing: we can introduce numerical versions for our API. So, our write routine would be looking like this: if version is greater or equal to two then we will write our last trade price. Otherwise, we just skip it and write um, those uh, which are known for, the, uh, for our remote site. And that's actually it. Um, also, I've been talking about packets, and packets was lists of objects, how we distinguish one from another. Uh, let's say we have these uh, colorful boxes, and they are different objects. We need to know which is which. So it's easy. Let's give them just identifiers. So object number three, let's say it's quote, object number seven, something else, no object number two, it's a position or whatever. And uh, if we write this identifier before we write the whole object, uh, it's easy to parse it back. Um, of course, we need to remember when it was introduced. So we also keep track of uh, versions we were introduced in our API. Okay, um, so actually that's all we need in order to solve this problem. Um, and if we think about all this meta information we just introduced, we don't want to really uh, do everything manually. We don't want to write this boilerplate code because it's the same for each and every object, each and every field we are introducing. And probably we can collect it into a, a property-like file, which we call API descriptor. 
it starts with the version and then it has enumeration of all the classes, all the fields, uh, along with the, all the versions they were, uh, were introduced in and all the types of the fields and all the types of the classes. Um, as I said, we are really lazy in that. We don't want to write boilerplate code. Bec that's why we have these uh, um, code generation tools which actually generate everything for us. Um, because this is, again, a very sim uh, simple uh, approach and it can be automated, automated. We don't want to put this burden on the shoulders of our developers. So we have these tools that generate everything. They generate uh, uh, reading and writing routines. They generate uh, having this descriptor. They know versions they introduce, so they generate these ifs uh, in, the, in this, uh, those routines. And um, yeah, it just works for us. Um, by the way, does it look familiar for, familiar for you? Maybe you recognize something. Um, and I'm talking about protocol buffers. Have anyone heard about protocol buffers by Google? Uh, so this is actually a um, structured data serialization mechanism which, uh, which is language agnostic, so it's not related to any particular language. Um, Google use it extensively in their backend side, on their backend side and also in the mobile uh, applications for some of the services. Uh, it's mm, kind of similar. They have these uh, objects called messages and uh, each message has a bunch of fields which has uh, identifiers. So before they write, <coughs> before they uh, serialize the field, they serialize its identifier and on the remote side they again can uh, recognize if they're aware of this field or not. Um, this is a very nice technology. You can have a look uh, if you didn't uh, yet. Uh, but um, the problem is that you must know exactly what you are reading or writing. So it, you just, it does not support an out-of-the-box transferring of these lists of data we want. And um, I've been talking about uh, the serialization library. And if you want to uh, have standard tools they offer uh, as well, like uh, they call it uh, gRPC, Google Remote Procedure Calls, um, they don't offer that network stability I've been talking about. So I if there is an error, you have to resend everything manually, handle all the er errors manually, but otherwise it's really nice uh, tooling and you probably want to check it out. So uh, let's go further. Let's go, let's speak about data efficiency because Google also have the, uh, some smart things in their protocol buffers uh, in order to save uh, bytes. Um, we also do it um, in a quite different way, but um, the most important is that we don't treat our data as just a bunch of bytes. We know exactly what these bytes are and we can be a little bit more data aware here. Uh, let's imagine a simple screen. Uh, this is a watch list and by watch list we just mean a table of uh, financial instruments like shares and stocks uh, along with their prices and other mar market data. Imagine we have three updates per second. Imagine we have ten symbols uh, which is 10 rows and 10 columns, and uh, imagine that each column is 4 bytes per value. Having this, we already have 10 kilobytes per second. Is it big value? Should we bother? Um, let's find out. Um, what if we transfer only diffs? Because um, prices are not strikingly fast changing data. They can change dramatically, but it takes a lot of time in order th to them to change. So usually uh, in a short period of time, the delta of the, of the value is uh, very small. And um, delta usually fits in one byte if we're talking about numbers. And if we fit everything here in one byte, we already have uh, four times faster, uh, um, I mean, four times less data. And this is just a theoretical um, talking, right? So let's have a look at real numbers. Um, we've got these numbers from a uh, real scenario, we get fairly big account, it has like 3,000 positions or so, so it's really a lot of data to come, and we get uh, around one megabyte per second without diffs. Within uh, the very similar um, conditions, we get uh, like three updates per second and everything uh, like this. So as we apply diffs, we reduce it by a third, actually, uh, by two thirds, so it's around uh, three hundreds kilobytes per second, which is nice. Can we do better? I think so. Let's have a look at another example. This is chart. Uh, the chart is just a series of historical data and usually, um, but not strictly so, uh, chart has around, let's say, th uh, 3,000 points. And what if we calculate diff? 
between previous chart and the current chart. We will have 2,999 zeros in that div because only the last one, the last point, represents the actual data. So all the, all the previous points are history and they probably uh, will not change now, uh, ever. So yes, we can feed those 2,999 zeros each in one byte, but still a lot of bytes we can probably um, shave off. And uh, for that we use zip compression. One probably asks, uh, does zip work on binary? Because we used to have a, a really good uh, um, results with zip uh, compressing the textual data. Well, um, it depends on your data, because if you have a lot of regularities in your uh, data, uh, and obviously we do because we send structured data again and again, and uh, different calculating difference helps us to introduce even more regularities, uh, such as zeros in the previous example. Uh, so it must work very good. And uh, the example, another, uh, another very well known example of using zip on binary is uh, portable network graphics format, which um, one of uh, one of the step of compressing to that format is just zip compression. So they um, introduce a little bit more regularities in their f in their data in their raw bitmap, and then zip it. So we do actually pretty much the same. We calculate diff, uh, introducing more regularities, and then we use zip, and we get ten less ten times less data with this approach. So in our real scenario, we have in thirty kilobytes per second using diff and zip instead of just using um, diff. Do you cal calculate here the efficiency we got from uh, eliminating sending a text-based format as a XML um, and just sending a... So these comparis comparisons are based only on the binary part. Only on the binary, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question, and it's uh, actually hard to answer because the text data can be represented differently. It it can be XML, as you mentioned, so it has a lot of text in it. It can be JSON, and it depends on how long are their field names, our field names, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, it's uh, fairly hard to to create a meaningful example which gives you like a reference number because there's no such thing. But we strongly believe that uh, they they're going to be a lot more data if you, you if you transfer textual representation because uh, instead of transferring even four bytes you will transfer uh, four symbols and each symbol is usually one to two bytes so um, yeah we strongly believe that um, it just stand out from 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 textual representation so concluding everything it seems like it's a perfect uh, solution right are there any drawbacks um, yes actually there are so first of all this is custom technology right so uh, for new developers or for those who are unfamiliar with that, we have to, uh, somebody has to learn it. So uh, even if uh, I describe it as like very simple to use, it's, it's still a technology to learn, right? So even a simple thing, you have to get familiar with that. You have to understand principles and so on th so forth. So it's a little bit steeper learning curve maybe for, for one to start with. And um, also as it's using that techniques in order to transfer everything in as much as compact as possible um, we have to introduce additional tools for testing and debugging because you just can't print that JSON you send in order to see if the data is fine or, or it's a bug in your UI um, you have to be smart here as well and um, for sure nothing comes um, without a price so uh, there is extra memory and CPU usage footprint because uh, just in order to calculate the diff you know you need to keep the previous version in memory and uh, also in order to calculate the diff you have to do some something with your cpu time and in order to compress everything etc cetera, etc cetera, there is a um, a little bit of a memory and cpu usage footprint uh, but we think that's a fair trade off for the best user experience for the best possible way of delivering data and uh, yeah we just don't want to give up that in, in favor of, uh, um, I don't know. Um, also, the mobile devices nowadays are much more powerful and fast, so probably less um, things to bother about. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free.